Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Open Access Publishing in Canada Next Steps panel. My name is Michael Donaldson, and I'm the manager of the Open Access Program at Canadian Science Publishing. Today's session looks like it'll be a really interesting one. We have some, some great panelists that are all experts in open access that represent different stakeholder groups. I'd like to start by giving a brief presentation on open access and the, sort of the history and the evolution of the open access publishing world and where we're at today, just to kick things off. So in terms of open science and open access, the term open access is usually referred to making research immediately and freely open access without restriction. And it's usually specifically geared towards referring to publications. But open access is just one aspect of open science. And many of you may have seen the, the session earlier this morning on open science in Canada and the, the different aspects of open science that uh, are represented by that term. So open access is sort of part of this umbrella of open science, but open science also includes open data. So including access to, to data and research information, open source, including research software and, and uh, platforms to make content available. Open infrastructures, which includes making content available through, uh, through open platforms. Open evaluation, which refers to um, the, the tenure and promotion and kind of the transparency associated with that in terms of academic institutions. Open education and education resources. And also openness to knowledge diversity, which would include openness to traditional knowledge as well as citizen science as well and the various traditional knowledge systems that are involved in, in, uh, in knowledge diversity. So open access has been uh, conceptualized for a long period of time, but it really took form in 2002 with the Budapest Open Access Initiative. And since that time, we've seen quite a bit of growth in terms of open access book publishing, as well as open access book publishers. We've also seen a rise of open access journals and, and mega journals, which now make up some of the largest publications by volume uh, of, of open access journals or all journals as a whole. We've also seen growth of what's called gold open access, and that has traditionally, up until the past few years, referred to publications that are made uh, rapidly open access, so immediately upon publication, and they're free to access, but there is a fee that's charged, and it's traditionally been the article processing charge model that has been used to fund open access. It's often paid by, by researchers, but a number of new models have been proposed in recent years to explore uh, gold open access options. We've also seen growth of green open access repositories as well, and there's a number of discipline specific as well as institutional specific repositories. And in many cases, those repositories make a certain version of a published article freely available. So that could be uh, the, the author accepted version, uh, in which case the authors have, have a, the ability to make their publication either immediately available through the accepted version or after an embargo period, and that content can be freely accessed through, through different means. There's also bronze open access as well, in which case the publishers often make content freely available. So through these three different uh, versions of open access, we've now seen quite a bit of growth in terms of the amount of journal content that is, that is available uh, as open access now. In recent years, there's also been a, a bit of a, a shift in thinking about transformative open access options. So that's the idea of taking subs subscription-based content or journals that were previously subscription-based and developing new models to transform them over time to be fully open access. So now there's been over 160 major agreements that have been registered. Uh, some of those are in pilot phases and they're, they're relatively early in their incarnations, but we've seen a number of different publishers and institutions that, that have uh, tried to reach new, new agreements to explore different types of transformative open access models. And we'll hear a little bit more about those later on as the panelists share their, their thoughts. Plan S is a, is a major initiative uh, that's designed to, to really advance open access publishing. And we actually have um, a speaker, one of our panelists, who will talk a little bit more about Plan S. But it's, it's actually the, the lead up to Plan S being implemented, uh, actually will be implemented in about a month's time. The lead up to the implementation has really uh, garnered a lot of discussion, a lot of movement in the open access front. And that's actually been one of the large precursors for developing these transformative open access models. And in Canada, we heard this morning about uh, our, our open access federal roadmap, um, which or open science federal roadmap, I should say, which has been put forward by, by the Office of the Chief Science Advisor. We've also had quite a bit of development in terms of the tri-agency uh, open access funding policies for, for publications. And we'll hear more about those from one of our panelists as well. And we've also seen quite a bit of, of new development in terms of open access infrastructure and new approaches to open access, including platforms like ARID and uh, the Coalition Publica, which we'll hear about later on as well. 
So we've seen quite a bit of momentum on the open access front, and I think it's really starting to take shape. Um, if you look at the amount of growth in terms of open access articles that have been published, we've seen a really rapid acceleration uh, over the past few years. Back in 2010, we had about 68% of content was closed access, and about 31 was open. And most recently in 2019, we're actually approaching almost a 50% mark for content that's open. And we may soon exceed that with, uh, with movements like Plan S and other open access initiatives throughout the world. So it's been a, a fairly rapid shift in recent years, and we're getting to a point now where open access is, is starting to tip the scales a little bit. But it is a complex world when we think about uh, open access and funding open access. There's a number of stakeholders that are involved in both the creation of content as well as the access to that content. So in terms of creation and support, we have the researchers, the librarians, publishers, research funders, and research administrations, the administrators that all work in the background to, to create the, the open access content and make it widely available. Then we also have the users of the content, which include researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and the public, as well as many other stakeholders involved in accessing open access. So there's a number of players that are involved, and that does lead to some complexities when it comes to funding. And we've seen that. We've seen a number of different models that have emerged and uh, different challenges associated with those models. But we're also in a good position to discuss those challenges and try to find ways to move forward in a sustainable manner. And that leads us to our topic for today, which is open access publishing in Canada next steps. And the focus of this presentation or the, of this panel is really to talk about how we can advance uh, open access in Canada, how we can do so in a sustainable way. And also we're, we're leaning on some of our international colleagues. We have a, some panelists that are international that are able to share their insights and perspectives, and we may be able to learn some, some new information from them on how we can turn the dial towards open access here in Canada. So in terms of our panelists, we have a great group of speakers today. Our first speaker will be Alicia Wise. So Alicia is an independent consultant for Information Power, Information Power Limited. She's passionate about expanding open access uh, publications, and she's done so from the perspective of publishers, libraries, and funders as well. She's also involved in boards, uh, in the uh, service of boards, including Chorus, Clocks, and Research for Life. John Malinsky is the Kosla Family Pro uh, Professor at uh, of Education and Associate Dean of Student Affairs at Stanford University. He's also a member of the Royal Society of Canada and directs the Public Knowledge Project, which conducts research and develops the world's most widely used open source scholarly publishing software. Our third panelist is Claire Apavu. She's the Executive Director of the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. And she's also the incoming chair of the Governing Council of the Scope 3 Initiative. At CRKN, uh, she's involved in advancing interconnected, sustainable access to the world's research and to Canada's documentary heritage content. Our four speaker is Susan Haig. She's the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, or CARL, and is associated, which is an association of Canada's 31 largest research libraries. She oversees a range of national initiatives to promote sustainable open scholarship, to build research data management capacity, and to advocate for strategies for uh, research libraries and their communities. Our fifth speaker is Tim Wilson. He's the Associate Vice President of Research Programs at Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, or SHRC, and he is responsible for overseeing the agency's grants and scholarships programs. Johan Rursik is the Executive Director for Coalition S and a visiting professor at Leiden University. And as I mentioned myself, I'm the moderator and I'm the Open Access Program Manager at Canadian Science Publishing. So I'd just like to say that in terms of the format for today, We'll have the, the, uh, the ability to listen to each of our panelists speak for a few moments, and they'll share their thoughts from their own perspectives on how we can advance open access publishing in Canada in a sustainable manner. Uh, we'll also have an opportunity towards the end of the session to discuss, uh, to receive questions and answers from the audience as well. So we'll, we'll uh, use the chat or the, um, the chat function, and we have uh, the Slido. Uh, uh, function to be able to enable um, the question and answer period. So there's a QR code that you can use to scan with your phone, or we'll post the link in just a moment uh, to, sh to show you how you can access that uh, website to be able to post questions, and we'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the session. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Alicia, and I think we, we may slow show that the Slido sli slide in just a moment as well, but we'll, we'll turn it over to Alicia for the first panel presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And let me just share my screen. Go in 
into presentation mode. There we go. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Um, it's brilliant to be able to join you. Um, it's quite dark here in London in England, um, and England, but it looks sunny in Canada. So terrific uh, uh, start for the afternoon. I'm here today to share with you the outcomes from a project that was called Society Publishers Accelerating Open Access and Plan S. This was a project that ran during 2019, and it is, I'm sorry, and um, it was sponsored by Coalition S, so Johan Rorick's um, organization. He'll be talking about Coalition S a little bit later in the program. But the purpose here was that Coalition S, a group of international funders who are dedicated to driving forward and accelerating open access, were keen and concerned that small and medium-sized publishers should be able to make a successful transition as well. And they were hearing from those communities that there were some concerns about where the business models were that would enable small and medium-sized publishers to thrive. So our project was launched with the task of tracking down those business models and to particularly focusing, uh, focus in on the most promising, um, and we, we've developed um, a free toolkit to help um, libraries and publishers implement it. So the URL in front of you is where you can access all of the project outputs. There's a report and there's a toolkit that's freely available and reusable that organizations can use if they want to enter into open access agreements, which I'll be explaining in a little bit more detail next. So we um, did interviews and surveys with funders, librarians, and publishers right around the world. This was not research that was um, confined to the UK. We uh, talked to a, a few stakeholders in Canada, the United States, Asia Pacific, and in the Southern Hemisphere as, as well. And what we learned uh, by talking um, with the community uh, was that there are a huge array of potential business models and business strategies that can help small and medium publishers accelerate their move toward open access. In fact, we found 27 of these approaches, which I'll show you on our next slide. We then surveyed in a more systematic way, library consortia um, and society publishers to find out which of those 27 models they tried already, which worked, which wouldn't work, which could scale um, and what they thought uh, they needed to make uh, successful transitions. We then um, focused in on uh, some workshops and in particular, these open access transition agreements, which emerged as the most promising transition model. We did some really in-depth uh, work with libraries, library consortia and society publishers to develop principles and uh, again, the toolkit for implementing that model. So what are those 27 business models? So if you're sitting right now thinking of open access as being all about article processing charges, where an author pays up front to make their article in a journal open access, please stop right there. There's much more um, that comes under the banner of open access. And there are lots of ways um, to sustainably fund a journal um, so that it can be open access. I don't unfortunately have time to go into all of these models today, but they're clearly presented in the report, which is freely available at that URL that I showed a minute ago, and that will be on the last slide as well. What I want to focus in on are transformative agreements. Um, Mike, Mike's all already introduced these. Let me talk to you in a little bit more detail. These emerged as the most promising suite of models from both a publisher perspective but also crucially from a library perspective. And the reason is that essentially this um, provides an active way for libraries to support a drive uh, to the transition to open access because it enables them to repurpose their existing institutional spend, which goes on subscriptions traditionally, um, and they can interact with publishers in a new way. And this enables um, subscription access, but also for researchers on the library's campus to publish open access with no or deeply discounted um, open access fees. 
Libraries provide the lion's share of funding to publishers around the world. And so if that money changes, it transforms to drive open access, so too um, publishers can follow and they can transform their journals to follow the revenue stream. And this is much easier for small and medium-sized publishers to administer. They have one agreement or one invoice with a campus rather than having to think about how they could possibly scale up to administer hundreds or even thousands of different agreements and invoices at an author level. Some of the reasons that small and medium-sized publishers can find this model very attractive is that it, it has some of the positive features of a, of a subscription model for them. It gives them a steady, predictable revenue stream. They know up front at the beginning of the year roughly what their income can be or will be, and they can cut their expenses to fit that cloth. But there's some real challenges as well. Um, one is that small and medium-sized publishers traditionally don't have much direct access to libraries and certainly not direct access to library consortia. Um, the the uh, attention um, and the, the mind space of many libraries is, is, is taken up by dealing with the, the 10 or so very largest publishers. So there needs to be a way of, of um, increasing capacity for small and medium publishers to get a look in. Um, the society publishers who piloted this approach signaled how important it is actually to have a full year run in to, to test and to develop. There's a lot of change that needs to go on behind the scenes in their businesses to make this work well. And for example, they need to pull together data from their submission systems, their production systems, their finance systems to provide two or three years worth of data to negotiate sensible prices. Here are some examples of different flavors of open access agreements. Um, you might hear Knowledge Unlatched or Scope 3 mentioned today. Um, these are uh, models where a single choreographer, as it were, an, um, an, a central organization will collect money in from a lot of libraries and then pay publishers for publishing uh, the journal's open access. So Scope 3, for example, has resulted in the transition of all high energy physics titles fully to open access in a sustainable way, brilliant. Read and publish models, these are where a library will say, yeah, we'll, we'll pay you what we have been paying, but we'd like to both subscribe to your um, content and we'd also like our authors to publish with you without paying APCs. Subscribe to Open is another one of these very successful transition models. This is where a publisher says to all of their existing subscriber base, come with us on this journey, help us flip this title to open access by telling us that you'll continue to, to, to subscribe and to continue providing the revenues that you already are. And very excitingly, we're seeing that model now extended to books. Just last month, the Central European University Press announced for the first time that they were going to use the subscribe to open model um, for monographs. The idea is that libraries pay for back titles and all of the future titles will be open access. Now, very quickly, the last few slides, I just want to show you what this looks and feels like from a library perspective. These models were invented um, by the Max Planck Digital Library. And the librarians there mapped out all of the publishers that their researchers publish with. They came up with the top 20 and then a big slice here in the top left, all of the other long tail of small and medium publishers. They immediately could see that some of their top 20 publishers were already fully open access, job done. And then they set up out um, trying to enter into open access agreements with all of the rest of the top 20. In their first year, they made a few inroads. By 2020, this year, um, they had completed most of the segments and they were already beginning to do agreements with uh, small and medium-sized publishers. And in this way, all of the research outputs from Max Planck researchers will be able to be open access because they've repurposed their subscription money to drive open access publishing. And with that, just a reminder of the URL where you can find the report, all 27 of those business models and the free toolkit in case you're a publisher or a library who wants to dip your toe in the water to try one of these OA agreements out for yourself. Thanks very much.
And John, over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm John Walensky, and if you've forgotten some of the introductions from Michael's <laughs> Uh, introduction to us. Um, I'm the professor um, in the group, at least uh, one of them, um, and I come to you as a uh, someone who is a researcher in the area of open access. I'm a professor of education, um, but I've become convinced that access to research is an educational aspect, in fact, a public educational aspect. Free access to research is a great source of knowledge and understanding, um, as many of us are understanding seeing now with uh, COVID and the debates around the place of science and determining how we respond to the pandemic. Um, I'm also an advocate, as you'll tell very quickly, but I want to be upfront about it. I'm not pretending I do research on open access, um, but I do see the value as an educator. Um, and so my research looks into questions of the impact, um, different economic models, ways of moving forward. And finally, I'm a tool builder um, in the sense of trying to provide support for open access um, by developing tools for publishing open journal systems. Michael mentioned, and we're quite proud of, of how widely it's used. Um, and this is part of my work with the Public Knowledge Project at Simon Fraser University. Um, I want to just acknowledge uh, from Alicia's talk that uh, 27 business models, I've actually never heard that number before, so I'm uh, appreciative that it's that many, but this is where we are. This is the idea that we have accepted that open access uh, is the way forward for science, that not only libraries, but publishers and societies and researchers, um, the universities themselves, the funding agencies have all acknowledged um, that open access is the right way to proceed. And so at this point, we're thinking about how best to get there. And the question then is no longer, is open access going to be as it was 10, 15 years ago, a threat to science or a threat to research? Those questions are gone. We see it is the right way to go, and the pandemic is made very clear in terms of treatments, in terms of the vaccines, the sharing of knowledge and data and research um, has been a great contributor to the successes and to the challenges that we still face. Research um, is an antidote. So this idea then that we are now considering different ways of thinking about open access and what models would be the best way of arriving there. Uh, the progress to date is around 30% of the research articles that are available online are open access, about 50, close to 50% of the current ones are most recently published, but the whole body of literature is around 30%. So we are roughly a third of the way to universal open access, which is really the model that we want having partial access, whether it's for your school teacher or physician or professional and, and or member of parliament, we don't want them working on a random basis of having one out of three article, of it, article research papers available. We want them to have access to the whole corpus. So among the models, uh, the, the project that I'm working with, the Public Knowledge Project, is involved in two. Uh, Claire will be, uh, who's coming up, will be speaking to, I hope, um, the Partnership for Open Access. Um, yes, she's smiling, that's good. Um, and it's part of our work with Coalition Publica, which is a, a national platform development with Erudite at the Université de Montréal. Um, and it's been negotiating successfully contracts with the uh, Canadian Research Knowledge Network. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that one um, because that is a national strategy I'm very interested in what we can think about in terms of researchers across the country who are working outside of Canada. Many Canadian researchers publish and are involved in societies and are editors in uh, journals and other organizations outside of the country. Um, so I'm really speaking to a model that is broader than, than um, the typical uh, Canadian perspective on Canadian journals particularly in the social sciences and humanities, but also Michael represents uh, Canadian science journals. Um, and I'm going to pick up on one example from Alicia's 27. Um, you don't have to remember them all, um, but the, the one I want to take is the subscribe to open model, uh, which is one I've been working with very strongly, as Alicia knows. Um, and I want to talk a bit about not so much the model itself, but the principles, the guiding principles that you need to, as listeners and, in, and those interested in open access, that you need to stay attuned to. These uh, slides, by the way, are not mine, um, but they are very good slides, so we'll just stay with me, um, if you can, please. Um, so the 
sorry, the subscribe to open model, um, the simplicity of the model is the first thing. Um, and this is a very important principle. Do we have a simple model to understand how we can get to open access? And the simplicity of subscribe to open um, begins with the very concept of subscribing to an idea. So you subscribe to an idea, you subscribe to it and support a journal. You can subscribe to many things. In this case, we're saying that libraries are very deeply committed to subscribing to the idea of open. Uh, and to make that as simple as possible, um, the subscribe to open model works from the publisher's perspective um, with a renewal. You send a renewal to libraries, the renewal notice you send every year with one difference. Simplicity always begins with one, uh, with one difference. And that one difference in this case is the renewal says, by virtue of your support at the same rate that you normally pay with a slight increase for inflation and all that sort of thing, the same rate will make one difference. The library will be, sorry, the library, the journal will become open. By virtue of your support, librarian, this journal will now publish in an open access format. No additional charges for the library, no change in revenue for the journal. The difference is everyone can read it. And that's the first aspect. Everyone can read the entire journal. It doesn't depend on the subscription, on the read and publish model, which is just a point of contrast here, where uh, only the open access journal, sorry, the open access articles come from authors whose libraries subscribe to this transformative model. The entire journal becomes open. It becomes open to every author to publish in an open access format. There is no charge to the author. There's no embargo to the article. The published version of the article is available on publication. And so Subscribe to Open takes a very simple principle that libraries are supporting journals because the journal is of value. Not to exclude anyone else from having access to the journal, as is the case perhaps when you buy, no, is actually the case when you buy a bicycle. But in the case of journals, it is a, it is a transaction of support an investment in the value of the of the journal to the library community and that simplicity and that equity are principles that i'm suggesting should guide our vision for open access in the future if this is the right way to go we need a simple and an equitable model so no matter where you are working as a scholar in a subscribe to open journal you can publish open access in it no matter where you're working, all of the articles in that journal will be freely available for you to read in public libraries and schools and universities everywhere. Now, the model is relatively new and somewhat unproven, but what we have to date, the first year, that's this year, 2000, uh, we had two, two publishers, Annual Reviews and Berghahn Books, with about 17 titles open access. Um, 2021, we're up to nine publishers and 74 journals. That's an exponential increase. I can't guarantee it'll continue at that rate, um, but if it did, we would be very fortunate. Um, Johan is gonna be talking to you in a moment um, about Plan S. And Plan S has shown some interest in paying into this model so that it could support the libraries by paying for those articles that for which there is a research sponsor. So in a variety of ways, we're bringing together the very simple principle that we support open access, that we need equity of, of access to both publishing and to reading, um, and we need a, a sense of transformation, for sure, um, but one around this principle of simplicity. The final thing I will say, Michael, um, is that I'm um, also working on a copyright version of this because the one thing that's missing for publishers is the assurance element that subscriptions give you, the closed subscription or the APC model gives you. Um, and so it seems to be a natural to bring copyright in line with this model. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Sean. And thanks also to you, Alicia. Uh, great presentation so far.
I just wanted to make note that uh, we, we've already received a couple of questions coming in through the, the Slido uh, link, but um, if, if you are interested in asking a question, we'll have a period at the end after the panelists have presented, and uh, we'd love to have some, some additional questions. So the, uh, the Slido link uh, should, should appear in just a moment, and uh, yes, we welcome the questions from you. So next up, we have Claire Apavu, Apavu from CRKN, and she'll be presenting uh, on progress towards a national strategy for open access. Claire, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, CRKN's uh, movement uh, in progressing towards a national strategy for open access. Um, as, CR, as many of you may know, CRKN was founded to increase access to research outputs for Canadian researchers through national licensing of digital journal content and databases. As CRKN evolves, we now support a continuum of access, not only to the large uh, commercial journal database content, but also supporting Canadian scholarly publishers, national and international open access initiatives, and increasing access to our own digital Canadian heritage content. The commitment of our members at CRKN to move towards open access led to a transition of some of our former licenses to collaborations for open access, as John just uh, spoke of, um, and particularly uh, with ERUD and uh, PKP for Coalition Publica. We increase our support for and participation in open access initiatives in other areas as well, um, particularly in init international initiatives, such as uh, Scope 3 that's already been mentioned, and more recently, participation in SCAS. Whoops. <laughs> that's a very uh, slippery little slide uh, movement there. Um, CRKN's uh, negotiation and um, a core activity of negotiation and licensing um, is evolving. And as uh, Dr. Bubala stated in the previous session, sustainability is vital to us. So as we evolve to integrate more focus on open access, we must at the same time address the urgent need for reduced costs to ensure that these licenses are sustainable as we move forward. And all of that we seek to do within a transparent environment. So uh, how are we going about doing that? To support that negotiation and licensing strategy, we have updated the principles which underlie our program, and we will be sharing those publicly, not only with our own members and stakeholders, but also with publishers. We aim to transform the scholarly communication system towards sustainable open access by negotiating for both sustainably um, lower subscription costs and at the same time increasing open access. We believe in equity of access that publicly funded research should be made available immediately at no charge to the reader. We're committed to authors understanding and retaining the rights to their research output. We're committed to open social scholarship and support that through negotiating sustainable agreements that emerge from a, di a diverse scholarly publishing landscape that facilitates bibliodiversity and helps Can Canadian not-for-profit publishers to compete and thrive. Finally, we recognize the value of transparency. Global transparency equals and enables equal access to information, it fosters trust, and leads to fair negotiations required for fair agreements. This year, CRKN sought support for our negotiation objectives by forming an aligned stakeholder group with leaders from across Canada's scholarly communications and research community. These include our chief science advisors, university presidents, funding agencies, and faculty. Although they are not part of our negotiating team, they demonstrate their support for CRKN's negotiation objectives, and they bring additional leverage to our negotiating table. Members of the Stakeholder Alignment Group this year were invited to participate in our um, initial meetings with uh, Elsevier for our uh, triannual renewal um, discussions with Elsevier. They were instrumental in conveying to senior Elsevier staff the main objectives that the entire Canadian research community has, which is to seek 
um, to achieve cost reduction, increased open access, and the removal of non-disclosure and confidentiality clauses. Sorry. Um, as we build on and amplify the success of our international um, colleagues, we want to um, leverage the, the information that they have, uh, the, the work that they have done. And I think Alicia um, spoke very clearly on some of that, that our principles should align globally, that we should be taking as an international strategic approach that we should, and I really feel this in Canada especially, pull funds that are being spent with publishers on both APCs and subscriptions, that we should remove these non-disclosure clauses, and that we should harness the negotiating power of the full research community to back libraries and negotiations with large commercial publishers. In taking advantage of these um, underlying principles and these strategies that others have used internationally, we can um, strengthen our own negotiating power here in Canada. And as we look forward at CRKN to the future, we have um, already negotiated and are about to make public our first transformative agreement with a large commercial publisher. And we continue to ensure that this is a transitional deal, that we will be moving towards a new future. In doing these transformative agreements, we should be, and especially sustainable transformative agreements, we should be freeing up money to continue to reinvest in Canadian research infrastructure and Canadian um, support of Canadian society publishers. We are continuing to negotiate for some sustainable agreements with all of our publishers. We're continuing that support for the not-for-profit publishers in Canada and we support increased access to content in Northern Canada as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. That's, that's fantastic. I just want to quickly mention too that for the, uh, the Slido link, if you're interested in asking any questions, the event code is hashtag or, or pound sign RSC2. So I think that information is up on the screen now. And there's also the QR code if you prefer accessing it that way. But we have a few questions coming through now, which is great. But for those that are, if you're having trouble accessing it. So next up, we have Susan Haig, who's the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. And she's uh, speaking today on the topic of advancing open some progress and some opportunities. Susan, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about Carl, about what Carl with others has been up to and mention a few thoughts on what might be next steps. I do think there may be an opportunity given the context of COVID and what it has taught us to take bold as opposed to baby steps in the direction towards open and scholarly communications. Uh, Carl published a scholarly communications roadmap in 2017 and it continues to guide our efforts. Recently, we have had a few meetings involving CARL, CRKN, and all the funding agencies, and together we have articulated an informal collaborative action plan covering these four factors and more. Better tracking expenditures, considering sustainable cost-sharing models, enabling the tracking and showcasing of Canadian OA content, and considering strategies to broaden and improve research evaluation measures. I will speak to each of these in turn. To get towards sustainable openness, we first need to understand costs and expenditures. I won't speak to each of these numbers. The point is that we are getting a better sense of the cost of production, the cost of choosing the gold route to open access, what money is in the system, and who is spending what. Of course, and very importantly, in the open context, it's all public money. It needs to be wisely and responsibly spent. So at this point, libraries are spending maybe 3% of their library budgets supporting open, while they're spending about 44% of their budgets on collections expenditures, which as we hear, are, are, you know, some of that is what we're trying to get over towards open. Uh, the research funders um, at this point um, have been looking also at, at their support to APCs, and, and so far at this point we only have a sample from CIHR, uh, but it suggests like if we extrapolate, which Maybe we can, maybe we can't validly at this point, but it looks like there's over 40 million being spent on APCs out of research grants at this point. 
So what we think we need to do next is to better understand the total of APC spend, just to just to understand uh, again how much money is in the system and where it's going. We need to address both funding models and infrastructure, and and we've heard that already uh, by the other speakers earlier as well. So. Again, there's been good progress. Uh, CRKN now has four fund opportunities, maybe more, I, I think it's four, um, for libraries to help underwrite open content and open infrastructure. And the government has just announced the $1 million per year for three years to Coalition Publica, which John mentioned, which has had already received two solid investments from CFI in the past. I believe there are opportunities now to make a case for increased support from the federal government. We have been having conversations about what this would entail for both monographs and journals to inform what I believe should be a collaborative effort to make any asks of the government. And I think Tim will have more to say as well on that. I, I, I had mentioned on the last slide, SCOS, in the, in the context of CRKN's involvement as well. Just want to sit, take a quick sidestep to say a further word about it as Carl has been active in it. Uh, SCOS is, a, is the Global uh, Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, an organization established by Spark Europe in 2017 to which both Carl and CRKN belong. It promotes global library investment in a curated set of worthy infrastructures that are on slightly project-based fun funding, so uncertain, uncertain funding footing. Uh, these may be directories supporting identification of OA publishing venues, journal production platforms, repository software, services, preprint archives, and so on. The aim is to put them on a sustainable financial footing through. Uh, it's a different model. In, in, in Alicia's terms, it's more the crowdsourcing, uh, promotion, pledging kind of model for funding. Soon there will be three more internationally recognized and used infrastructures added. I think it's important that we understand the layers of infrastructure and intended investment needed, local, regional, national, and international. Uh, the visibility and discoverability of open access publication matters too, of course. So a car collaboration with the European Open Air Project has been underway since January, 2018. In this, we are working with Canadian repositories to improve our metadata and enable its harvest uh, to open air. The Open Air Gateway then reflects a much more comprehensive collection of Canadian scholarly content. Open Air is now, has now fully integrated CIHR, NSERC, and SHRC um, into their aggregation, and users can limit results by each agency. Interestingly, NSERC has the fourth highest number of records of any funder in the Open Air database at this point. We need to continue to adopt new workflows and practices in our repositories, and we need to continue to actively promote the use of persistent identifiers, whether for researchers, digital objects, or organizations. I could have noted data, ORCID data site and the fact that we now have a PIDS advisory group in Canada, supported by CRKN, as progress here too. The progress I've reflected on this slide are not initiatives reflected by Carl but it really is important to advance the respect uh, for open publishing across the reward system uh, to change culture uh, and, and to, to basically transform to open. Um, so we're keenly interested in, in broadening research metrics in ensuring that authors can retain control over their works and publish them openly to see uh, both government and academia embrace open science and to implement policies, funding models and infrastructure supporting open. We need to step out of our silos and understand, in fact, create an ecosystem for open science. Both repositories and publishing have robust roles to play and the intersections with data infrastructure need to be considered as well. Carol believes that Canada, because we can work together, can become a model of progress towards open science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. That was, that was fantastic. Our next speaker will be Tim Wilson. And Tim is the, uh, the Associate Vice President of Research Programs at, at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Tim, over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yeah, uh, as a uh, as a representative of one of the funding councils, my perspective on, on this question uh, is, is one of, of the federal funding uh, uh, landscape 
and uh, so that's kind of my point of departure. And and when it comes to federal funding in, in this uh, area or federal in, intervention in this area, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's had quite a long history, but it's, it's, it's largely in the context, and I want to kind of make sure that I emphasize this, but uh, it's in the context of open government, actually. So uh, the government of Canada has had a number of open government plans for the last 12 years or more. And uh, the last few of these open government plans have had major pillars around open science. So it was in the context of these open science commitments uh, in the umbrella of open government that the federal government committed to ensuring that federally funded research was open access. So we implemented our tri-council uh, policy back in uh, 2015 uh, to that end. And... Um, so that uh, that policy, you'll uh, most of you may know, uh, Canadians here, uh, requires that uh, publications coming from uh, 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 funded research uh, be open uh, either immediately or after a 12-month embargo, uh, or in the, or it can take a green route through deposit in a repository. Um, so that's the good news that the federal government is uh, concerned about that and has been for a while. The bad news is we have a lot of evidence that people are not complying with the policy for a number of reasons, right? So we have uh, a study that was published in Nature uh, a couple of years ago that suggests that as, as low as 21% of SHRC-funded articles are being published open. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's a little bit higher uh, that a little bit higher uh, for NSERC, let's say in the 30%, and CIHR 50%, according to this study. So that uh, that caused some concern uh, in the in the tri councils, and we uh, we've we've done some work. We have a, a group that that uh, works together to ensure that we have a harmonized approach on this. And and uh, a big issue for us now is is to follow up on on monitoring compliance. We have some indications that the compliance may be slightly higher than that, but uh, still when we're talking about a rate of compliance that's lower than insight grant success rate, it's not good, you know what I mean? So we want to, uh, that's definitely on the horizon is trying to figure out how we can better enable compliance and, and better incentivize compliance with our own open access policy. So uh, also in the, in the uh, open science uh, umbrella of the tri the tri councils are working on a open or sorry a data management policy that should be released in 2021 we've been we've had a draft policy out for a couple of years that we've consulted on quite quite uh, extensively um, and what we're hoping to to uh, get out of this policy would be ensuring that well first of all ensuring that Canadian data sets are out there available, being used, driving innovation, ensuring that our Canadian researchers, our funded researchers are, are able with uh, their data literacy and with their uh, data, these data management principles, able to collaborate uh, on, on, on large international projects where data is becoming more and more the norm. Um, also that our research institutions are enabled to support these, these types of projects. So. Uh, so that's, I, I think, an exciting uh, frontier, both somewhat related to open access, but uh, but more so open science more broadly. The, the Tri-Councils, along with Genome Canada and uh, CFI, also recently signed the, uh, the uh, San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. And so we, we, we are cognizant of the fact that the research assessment, our own peer review pro processes are one of the let's say incentives or, or potential disincentives to publishing in, in the proper avenues to enable open access. Currently our, our uh, adjudication criteria uh, do not uh, reference um, uh, impact factor or anything uh, of that nature, but this declaration, signing this declaration, we have a joint statement on that just to reinforce the point that uh, we don't think that these sort of journal metrics should be substituted for um, 
for the quality of the research itself. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're doing policy-wise uh, with respect to open access, open science broadly. Um, in terms of open access enablers, uh, if we turn to the journal system itself, the journal ecosystem, so, so uh, uh, our published, so our funded researchers who are supposed to be publishing open, they need to have avenues, they need to have, they need to have options, open access journals to publish in. So wh what's the state of play? I think internationally, uh, I'm really impressed with the work that uh, that uh, Claire outlined in terms of what CRKN is doing. I think that's that's going to ensure that Canadian researchers have open um, uh, avenues for publication uh, in years to come. In terms of the Canadian journal landscape, we uh, we uh, commissioned a study of the socioeconomic uh, context of journals in Canada with FRQSA. Um, uh, and that, that study should be released in 2021, but the preliminary findings of uh, the Canadian, the Canadian journal ecosystem is pretty unique. Uh, I was, I, I had already known anecdotally that it was different from what you're going to find on the international scene, but the numbers are kind of striking. So there's 825 scholarly journals in Canada uh, and about 75% about of those are social sciences and humanities journals and the rest are, are STEM. Um, and 40, about 45% of those journals are already open, uh, immediately open. And then uh, when it comes to social science, humanities journals, another 18% are, are open with an embargo. Um, and the uh, the vast majority, the vast majority of these hundreds and hundreds of journals, the Canadian journals, are are small independent journals that are not attached to the big five. They're not they're not commercial profit ventures. So only five percent of these journals are um, are are with the big five. So I think uh, I I think that has a lot to do with what libraries have been doing. The fact that uh, I like to think that the fact that uh, when it comes to social sciences, humanities journals, SHRC has had an ongoing journal support program has helped somewhat uh, to, to ensure that there's that robust ecosystem. Uh, when it comes to this, the SHRC program that supports journals, uh, it's called the Aid to Scholarly Journals. Uh, we support about uh, anywhere from 120 to 140 journals uh, in, in a given year. Uh, at a, uh, about 30,000 per year. Um, from 2008 to 2018, the drive was really to ensure that these journals became fully uh, digitized uh, and uh, electronic. So uh, in 2008, almost all of them were print only. And by 2018, we, we put incentives in place in the program, extra costs for digitization of archived content so by 2018, they were all electronic only. So that's great. Uh, I think the next drive will be ensuring that they're open and discoverable. So the uh, the the, tw the last round we did in 2018, we changed the eligibility with, uh, requirements so that only open uh, access journals were, were going to be eligible, or they had to have a plan to become eligible over a couple of years. We put in incentives to to uh, journals to 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 do so in a non, um, uh, without using uh, APCs or article processing charges. Uh, the good news there is, again, on the Canadian landscape, these are not used really. So uh, of, of our journals, over 100 journals, only, uh, only two uh, use uh, article processing charges. Uh, so you're not getting the nature phenomena here in Canada, luckily. So uh, uh, at least with, with, with Canadian published journals. Um, the, uh, so I think for the future, so, so we've done that in terms of eligibility for open, but being open is more than just, it, it's freely available. It, I think the, the next hurdle is going to be discoverability and access. So, uh, there, I think, uh, what we're trying to do is, is, is work with, uh, John mentioned, uh, the, the coalition Publica. Um, we've, uh, 
we just uh, announced a, a three-year pilot funding for that uh, platform um, that would help enable uh, onboarding of our shirk funded journals so that they could take advantage of economies of scale where services could be provided by that platform for for everything from metadata to ensuring that uh, that the text and metadata are machine readable all these all these uh, 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 services and technologies that will help these journals become more uh, discoverable and more accessible on the world stage so uh, so we're excited about that and um, with that, I want to, uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks. That's great. Thank you very much, Tim. And our final panelist speaker today before our question and answer period is Johan uh, Rurik, who's the Executive Director of Coalition S and a visiting professor at Leiden University. Johan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm a linguist. I'm also an editor. In addition to uh, being an uh, executive edit, uh, director at Coalition S, and so today I'll I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, Plan S and Coalition S. Coalition S is a, a, a consortium of 25 organizations, with mostly research funders, but also research organizations, consisting of a set of uh, national European funders from going from Austria uh, to UKRI. It also has on board the European Commission. The entire Horizon Europe framework will be under. Plan as uh, rules and auspices. And uh, we also have uh, uh, five charitable foundations on board uh, Welcome Trust, Bill and the Gates Foundation, Howard Hughes, uh, Aligning Science Across Parkinson, and Templeton World Charity Foundation. Um, there's also a global dimension to coalitionists. The uh, World Health Organization has joined us last year, and we are, uh, we have uh, Jordan, Zambia, uh, South Africa, and the African. Uh, Academy of Sciences who are participating. We, of course, work in tandem with many other organizations worldwide, uh, such as America Cielo, an African open science platform, and especially, of course, OA2020. Uh, there's co coordinated action with 2020 and also uh, co coordinated action with the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. So just to present uh, uh, the, the picture here uh, globally. Uh, now, why was Plan S devised? Well, uh, research organizations in uh, Coalition S want to accelerate science by making results immediately available to the largest possible audience. Uh, we want greater uh, transparency in research communication and a cost-effective transition from the unsustainable subscription model to an open access model. That's the definite choice there. And what the, these uh, funder organizations want to do is to use their funding as a driver uh, and to leverage that to, to uh, aid the transition towards full and immediate open access. Now, it is based on very strong principles. The first principle being... Uh, presupposed in a way that research results are public good and should be immediately available for accelerating science. That means a lot of no's. It means no to paywall publications. It means no to embargo periods. It means no copyright transfer and publication under a CC by license. And it means no to the hybrid model of publication. Uh, hybrid model of publication, which is the model that, that most journals now use with part of the contents in open access, part behind the paywall. We are squarely against that uh, and, and we will not accept it except as a transitional arrangement with a defined endpoint, namely when those journals commit to transitioning in a defined, uh, in a defined time period from hybrid completely to, to open access. Um, now, we also are of the opinion that pricing, contracts and publication fees should be transparent and reasonable. This has already been mentioned by a few speakers today. Uh, funders uh, will commit to support these publication fees under Coalition S, uh, at least to the extent that they are reasonable and transparent. It is very important to know that under Coalition S, the individual researchers do not pay, which has also all, always been a problem, which is, has also always been a problem under uh, for open access, you know, how to find the funds for it. We also have multiple routes to open access compliance, of which I will say something in a minute. And uh, finally, and very importantly, we want to change the system of assessment, namely uh, uh, research uh, assessment of research outputs also for grant uh, applications should be based on the intrinsic merit of the publications and not on the, their venue of publication, the prestige, quantitative met metrics in accordance with DORA, Hong Kong principles and the Leiden manifesto. Um, because, of course, this 
uh, assessment system is what drives the current system for prestige, and that is something that we need to change um, uh, specifically. Now, with respect to the implementation of PANES, because as Michael said, we will start in a month, um, the, our goal was uh, that is to make sure that all uh, coalition as grant holders can publish open access in any journal of their choice. I mean, there's long been a bit of a, confu a bit of confusion about that. Uh, some people said that PANES only allowed the authors to publish in specific journals. That is not the case. I mean, any author can publish in any journal of their choice, but there are a certain number of conditions. And that is something that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. First of all, there's three routes to compliance. Uh, first, The first one is open access journals and platforms, diamond or gold, and if necessary, coalition S funders will pay for the APCs in these journals and platforms. The second one is transformative arrangements, and that goes from transformative journals to transformative agreements. So authors who publish in a journal with a transformative agreement, of course, can do so because uh, thanks to the consortia who have signed such read and published deals, those journals are uh, open access and also on their way to open access, the more of these read and published deals are signed. And then thirdly, and very importantly, our recent uh, green policy, uh, authors can publish in a subscription journal or in a hybrid journal, but in that case, they uh, are required to make uh, the peer reviewed version of their article immediately available in a repository with an open license via the rights retention strategy. And this rights retention strategy is something that I will, uh, that I will uh, clarify immediately because I think it's also important and interesting for Canadian um, researchers uh, because specifically the rights retention strategy do, does is, is not limited to researchers for coalition uh, as any individual researcher and any individual institution can apply the rights retention strategy should they choose to do so so i'm saying this from the start it's very important for uh, to, to mention so basically the idea is this Coalition S researchers, of course, who want to publish has, have to deposit this author and uh, author accepted manuscript in a repository with a CC by license, a, a, a BCC by license and a zero embargo. Now, this is going to be required by the Coalition S funders via the grant agreement. So it's going to be a contractual agreement that the author signs with the funder. Of course, Authors also, later on, when they are publishing, sign a copyright transfer with publishers quite often. And that creates a contradiction. And this is the contradiction that the rights retention strategy seeks to resolve because what we say is that the earlier agreement, the agreement with the funder, takes legal precedence over any later copyright agreement with the publisher on the condition that the publisher knows about this. That means that we have to give as funders prior notification to the publishers that this has, has been happening, that's just fair, and we have done so over the summer. Uh, 250 publishers and researchers must also of course upon submission inform the publisher that this is the case and that's why they need to include this language in their submissions um, so this is what we ask um, now of course coalition uh, grant holders must be able to identify how their journal of choice meets these different uh, policies right these three routes and that's why we have developed a journal checker tool. This journal checker tool uh, allows a researcher to type in their journal, their funder, and their institution. And the combination enables a researcher to find out how the journal of choice complies with Plan S. A better version of that journal checker tool is now available since 18 November. And I invite you to, to check it out. It's really very cool. I mean, it's amazing that we were able to do this in, in six months. Now, we also uh, have other activities on the roster. Uh, planned guest guidance specifies that we want transparency uh, in pricing. Uh, we want transparency because, of course, this will allow uh, more competition and will allow all stakeholders that prices are fair and reasonable. Uh, we have announced price transparency requirements in May 2020, and as of July 2022, only publishers that adhere to this plan, uh, this plan as transparency frameworks will receive funding for the publisher. So we will ask publishers to provide more insight into the prices that they charge. We will also, I'm sorry, we will also build a tool that allows us to compare prices and services to across journals and publishers. And that will be also made available, of course, for researchers and for libraries and for all commerce, except for publishers. 
Okay. So plan S, of course, is part, part of a much wider open access, open science movement and looking to accelerate transition to research results in open access. And to fully deliver on that ambition, we need a global coalition, we believe, of funders, also institutions, researchers, and publishers. We learn a lot from each other in this coalition, uh, all with, with all these experts jointly. And the advantage is really that the, 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 the expertise that we have in one organization gets a much wider realm uh, or much wider sphere of influence thanks to, thanks to the coalition. Okay, I will, I will stop here for now and we will, we can, you can ask questions during the discussion. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Johan. And thank you to, to all the panelists today. Those were excellent presentations. And I think we've, we've already covered a lot of ground today. So we are entering into the next phase of the panel, which is our Q&A session. And we've already received quite a few questions through the Slido uh, platform, but uh, I think we've just paste, posted the information again with the QR code and the, uh, the login details to, to ask questions in Slido. But I will uh, just begin with a few of the questions that, that are in there and um, we'll, we'll sort of, uh, start into these questions. We will see how, how much time we have to get through all of them. And I want to give everyone an opportunity to weigh in on them uh, where we can. But the first question that comes up is one that I think actually probably applies to, to all the panelists because it's sort of a, a, a more uh, general inquiry that I think is on a lot of people's minds. And that's the question of how do we address the current discussions suggesting that APCs and read and publish deals widen the gap between the well-funded versus the less funded researchers and institutions, which could in turn then further, uh, further the colonization of knowledge production and concentration of wealth. It's a, it's a big question, but I know it's something that's been on uh, and many of our minds uh, as we've been moving forward with, with some of these new models we've been exploring. Um, does anyone want to, to take a stab at that one? Alicia? Yeah, I, I think um, for APC-funded open access, um, this is a huge concern because only researchers who have access to grants that will cover the cost of open access publishing can possibly publish open access. This is precisely why read and publish um, and subscribe to open and other open access agreements are transformative. This is why they are so powerful because rather than expecting individual researchers to pay, the combined um, uh, financial uh, resource that's available from libraries, from their universities and from their funders can be brought together to fund open access publishing without the need for an individual researcher to dip into their pocket to pay an APC at all. And if these open access agreements are, are cost neutral, so the library and the consortia are paying about what they do now, then there's plenty of money around the world. Um, libraries and consortia in developed countries like Canada are contributing more to the global costs. Libraries in places like um, Botswana are also contributing what they are able to pay. We've just done a read and publish agreement or brokered one in, in that country, for example. So these can be really transformative in bringing everyone together to support open access as they are financially able to do. There needs to be more critical discussion and debate, though, about what a more equitable way is to apportion these costs between different types of libraries within a consortium or internationally um, between different kinds of countries. Yes, uh, Michael. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Claire. No, go ahead, Johan. That's fine. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I mean, uh, also even open access, uh, gold open access publishers are aware that this needs to happen. I mean, because uh, Alicia is mentioning uh, uh, read and publish deals, uh, but, but of course, open access publishers don't have access to that. But they are realizing progressively that this is needed, that the APC is actually a very uh, an equitable way of uh, sharing the cost because I mean it's a very strange product if you think of it an APC I mean it's the same for everyone the world over whether you live in Norway or in India it's the same price I mean that's one of the few services that has that that property but plus one for instance is plus one is experimenting with new ways of, of of doing this basically also inspired by the open library of humanities the idea being that indeed like alicia says you know every library uh, contributes as a function of their means and as a function of their their uh, their local um, price capacity um, purchasing power 
right? I mean, basically what you would need probably is a system in which every library contributes as a function of the size of the institution, so as a function of the, si the number of potential readers, as a function of the number of potential authors, and as a function of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, purchasing power. So if you take those three factors in cons into consideration, then everybody can contribute in a fair, transparent and equitable uh, way. And next year, one of the things that's on our agenda is to, to organize a webinar about specifically this, this issue. So hopefully we will see you there. Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think um, I want to build a little bit on, on what Alicia said, because uh, oh, the, one of the components that was successful internationally and in Europe in particular is that um, money from funding agencies was brought together with money from libraries. So when we say cost neutral, um, yes, we want it to be cost neutral for libraries, that means that money that is currently going to pay for APCs is coming in together with the money that libraries are paying for subscription. And that's not the situation we have in Canada. The deal that we are um, we are going to be announcing this year um, at, at CRKN, it, we are, the libraries are actually committing to pay a little bit more in order to allow um, the, to, to help fund those APCs. That's only because the particular publisher that we're working with, we don't have huge um, output uh, in that. And so the, it was, it was a, a, an agreement that we could manage financially. In, we couldn't do that with an, an Elsevier, for example, because the, the publication output um, of Canadian authors in those journals is so um, substantial that the amount of extra money that would be required is not sustainable by the libraries. We can't absorb that cost. So yes. I, think, I think that's a really key component. We need to be pooling the resources, and it's not easy. Uh, and as um, Susan very beautifully articulated, the um, in in some cases, and I'm sure Tim is uh, well on, uh, aware of this. The the funding agencies don't actually even know how much money is being spent um, on APCs. So they're and they're we're starting to get at some of that data now. But it's it's um, as as uh, somebody likes to call it, APCs in the wild out there. So yeah. how do we uh, access some of that fund? Well, some of the some of the problem may be addressed by new tools that are being developed. For instance, OA Switchboard uh, will solve, I think, most most of that problem because every article, I mean, under that system, every article be, will come with met metadata that will allow uh, a publisher to send it to a specific institution, whether it be a funder or whether it's a library. So that, that also gives a lot more grip on where the money goes and you know, what it is, what exactly is. Of course, that's a tool that's in currently in development, but it's definitely something that could help make those flows more transparent. Tim. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, so to these great comments, I'll just say, so yeah, the, if the money's already going there via the researchers' choices through different sources, um, if we can get an economical way to get that, I think that makes sense as a stopgap measure. But then the, the other question, I think everybody as a community, including the researchers, have to ask themselves is why are we publishing these journals that charge exorbitant APCs in the first place? So when Springer Nature announced that they were going to, like take your left arm or whatever they, that that new deal is or whatever, right? So for uh, for an APC, I heard I saw some social media traffic about, and this is what's got to start is well I'm not going to publish there anymore. I'm not going to do reviews for them anymore. And we need to we need that that and and like you say, Claire. Otherwise, money's going there anyway, and and we have to think about about ways to uh, to make sure that. People who don't have the grants can also publish in these these venues. That, that's a great point, Tim, for sure. And I think left left arm. I'm not sure if that even covers it. I think it might be left arm and maybe a leg as well. <laughs> uh, Susan or John, did you want to weigh in on that question, or we can we can move on to the next as well? No, I, time for a new question. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you all for your answers to that. Uh, that sounds great. So the, the next question is, how do libraries balance investment in their own open access publishing endeavors with those of publishers? Hmm. Susan? Uh, I, I think that's a, I think it's a, it's a 
decision that libraries ha have to make and, and some uh, put, put, put more into their local infrastructure and supporting journals that they're hosting and things like that. But I think there's rubrics that are emerging and, and our understanding of what's needed across the board is becoming a bit clearer. And uh, I, I think they're both valid and they both, uh, you know, all of the, like, you know, we always say it's sort of a multi-pronged thing, right? There's there's commercial publishers, there's homegrown uh, uh, content, there's homegrown infrastructure, there's global infrastructure, and we need to kind of weave it all together in a clever way. So I, I, I do think though, I, I think that the, the way that we've set up within a consortial uh, approach that, that the CRKN uh, administers, it, it does allow libraries to, to make some choices and to contribute according to their means and scale. And, and all of that works nicely for this country, I think, or at least has the potential to, to, to grow and work even better. And then we need to, as, as people have said before, understand what, what equitable sharing is possible. Um, so what else is, what other monies are available to, to advance? sort of on all fronts. I'd add that uh, the, sorry, Susan, I'd add uh, to Susan's comments that the libraries are playing a key role in hosting and, and taking on publishing uh, responsibilities themselves, both for undergraduate and graduate student journals, but also faculty journals. Um, so, and I wouldn't treat that as simply do it yourself in a kind of diminished way, but I would say it's the scholars who bring quality to the research literature and scholars working in collaboration with libraries bring that quality to bear in, in the journals that the libraries are working with. Yes, so there, there are a new spirit of cooperation, I think, is the general theme yes, for I us think, now. I, th I think that's especially, that should be especially the case for diamond journals. I mean, that's all, it is already the case. I mean, it's the case that, uh, uh, I mean, from the survey that we had at the, uh, uh, from the diamond study, we see that uh, in a lot of cases, diamond journals already have collaborations with uh, with libraries, but that should intensify, I believe, in the future. Because I mean, that's that's a very competitive, in my view, that's a very competitive model too, uh, with respect to the uh, the commercial publishers. But Johan, then we should look for ways of uh, funders supporting uh, these the library journals as well. Working um, on it, John. Working okay. on it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and again, I think it's uh, it, the idea here is not that the funders should be sponsoring generally. It should be the research they're responsible for, the research that they've already sponsored. Yeah, but because John, you be, yeah. yeah, no, no. But you will be happy to know, for instance, that OJS of those nineteen hundred journals that were surveyed, fifty uh, percent uh, uh, use OJS. So. All right. Okay, that, that was an infomercial, people, for uh, Open Journal <laughs> Systems and the Public Knowledge Project. Thank you, Johan. <laughs> well, thank you. Just doing that, we appreciate <laughs> all of us. Well, on that note of policy compliance and funding, um, there's a question about the tri agency OA policy having lower compliance compared to other funders like UKRI that have much, much higher compliance. Um, so, I guess. Part of the spirit of this panel is, is really trying to learn uh, what we can from our international colleagues. So I guess the question is, what can we learn from best practices uh, from the international perspective from other funders? So since UKRI was mentioned, I would say that one powerful um, thing, which is um, at the heart of the UKRI policy, is that its investment in open access is channeled through libraries and universities rather than through individual researchers. And what that means is that rather than um, uh, relying on many uh, individual researchers to change their publishing behavior, the funders are able to rely on libraries and universities using their purchasing power and their negotiating power to get much better value for money much deeper discounts and APC-free publishing on behalf of those researchers, those grant recipients. And, and that's a, a game changer. Yes, I, I, I would totally agree with Alicia there. The, the great strength, I think, of what we've seen in the last five years is exactly that. Uh, sharing of knowledge between consortia. Uh, that's what the OA2020, I mean, that, that's a great value, I think, of OA2020, sharing knowledge among consortia, because after all, the consortia negotiators were, were not born negotiators, right? I mean, and so they had to learn that. Uh, that that's one thing. I, I think also we should go towards even bigger consortia because that makes that you have much more power. 
So that's with respect to consortia. Funders also have banded together around Coalition S. And what we're seeing there every day is that this group of experts that we have really are able to share information across the borders. And by making a, uh, by, by making a unified policy, we, we, we are really able to influence the global discussion. Uh, and also to learn from each other. What, what I find the most valuable thing in Coalition S is this group of experts who exchange the information. And for instance, we learn from what, what the Netherlands are doing with open access books, for instance, that, or what COPEM is doing in the UK. This is something that will strongly influence our own policy on open access books. And, you know, by, by having that critical mass of experts that discuss these things, you, you, make, you just make a better policy. I mean, if, if we all do this in our corners, there is, that makes no sense. I mean, we really need to band together. And that's why I would really appeal, I mean, since I have the floor, that Canada also join Coalition S. That would be, I mean, you know, Michael, you asked me, you know, what's the one thing <laughs> that you would say to, to Canadian, uh, to, to Canada? I would say join Coalition S. It uh, will be to, you, to you, your and our advantage. Okay, Tim. Can I just add? I just want to add to that that I think, um, I mean, we, we as Carl have certainly been trying to um, encourage understanding of coalition of coalition ask uh, to get the word out to encourage the funders to look at it very carefully at least to align and to talk and to and to uh, keep a, abreast of it all so that's helpful i think but uh, just in the question of i think the funders um we a few of what i said sort of had to do with understanding better how to monitor compliance and then i think there is some work to be done in terms of in, enforcing and, and part of it is that we all we need to get better at how compliance can happen. So just make sure that the policies are implementable. And I think one of the things I admire about uh, Coalition House and what they're doing is that they really are addressing it holistically and putting the tools in place and, and ensuring that the capacity is, is, is built or the tools are, are built and, and rolled out at the same time. So I think that's all really important. Yes, so. but, but what I would also like to stress in that, um, uh, Susan, is that we, we do not ask that this be realized overnight. We, we realize that funders are, at different, are joining this at different speeds and at different uh, rates of progress. So we do allow for a lot of time for, 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 for funders to, to, to get up to speed within the coalition. I mean, it's very clear that, you know, even within the coalition, certain funders are much far, farther along than others. And one of the great things about the coalition is that we can help each other get there. That, that is, that is, and it's, you know, it's not, doesn't have to be done overnight. We have a couple of years, right? Yeah. It's just really important. The, the role of funders in this in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of laying the groundwork and, and sort of having the carrots and sticks. It's just, it's not to be underestimated, it's really important. And, and, and I think the investment is, is already there, uh, uh, or, you know, maybe it could grow a bit still, but it, it, it's really, they really have a, such a key role in all of this because of the, of, the, of the drive that they have for researchers as well, for researcher behaviors and, and so on and, and, and culture change. I, I would add that, that we're trying to do our part at CRKN to support the funding agencies as well in their policies by, and this is admittedly recent, um, but by uh, adding as one of our negotiation objectives that the publishers, that we, we leverage that buying power that we have, for example, you know, 35 million US dollars uh, with Elsevier, um, that we are le leverage that buying power to ask Elsevier to observe compliance for Canadian published articles with the, the funding agencies. Not saying we're necessarily 100% successful in that, but and it's a new thing that we're adding. But I think that is, you know, we can, we, this interplay of all of us as stakeholders to be able to achieve these end objectives is so vital um, so that we can, we can support each other in that. Yes, Claire, that's exactly what we found in Europe as well. For instance, in the Netherlands, uh, NWO, which is the, na the national funder, has, has joined the negotiations that the university libraries were doing. And that results in much more powerful, much more powerful negotiations because, I mean, the funder has, uh, it can, can be much stronger in many, in many ways in the negotiations. So this is really something that we found. One of the things, one of the recommendations that we also give to our funders is try to join 
those discussions about uh, read and publish deals because you can you can play a role. Yeah, that was exactly why we formed um, this year the stakeholder alignment group um, to to not to be at the negotiating table, but to really to be there present in front of the publishers at, at, at various stages to support those objectives. Tim, not to put you on the spot, but do you have anything else to add to that that question? Uh, the question of, of compliance and why it might be higher in uh, in other internationally, yeah. So yeah, I think that I think yeah, Alicia's point I think is bang on. I think uh, uh, just uh, and, I, and maybe um, uh, Susan mentioned this. Uh, I think monitoring compliance. We don't currently do that. We don't have a, a we 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 don't have a stick so to speak. So I'm not saying that we would. We're, we're looking at that in the future, but uh, obviously where uh, in the study that I mentioned, the Le Riviere and Sugimoto, it was uh, published ironically enough in Nature uh, the, in 2018, um, but it, uh, it, it had some, some key success points for the funders uh, that had very high compliance rates. So, uh, so monitoring compliance infrastructure, so th there's um, uh, they had uh, for especially for the foundations, you know, you basically have to publish through their venues or those types of things. So there was those compliance in well into the ninety percent for those those types of fora. So, so I think there's those those avenues that we need to explore. And then to uh, again to another point Susan made, I, I really want to focus on ensuring that the 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 avenues for compliance are there and understood. You know that they are. Uh, uh, and I think that's a first step that we can do. I think to the other question about Canada joining Plan S, like I, I, I know our presidents have, have expressed that we're in alignment with the principles of Plan S just in terms of uh, the specifics for us right now. Does it make, it doesn't necessarily make the best sense, but uh, like I think if we can get people to, to comply with our already you know, already allows a 12 month embargo. Uh, and we're having a difficult time getting the community to always comply with that. I think we concentrate on that for now. Uh, but uh, these are all good points that I'll take back to the commune and uh, share with our working group members. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so 2015. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, thank you all for that. I know we're, we're sort of in our final minutes here. We've only got about three minutes left, but I did actually receive one uh, comment that came in through email. And I just wanted to share it with you just to, to, if we do have a minute or two, just to get uh, perspectives on it. But the, uh, the comment went as follows. Um, I would like to propose that we revisit how we view and treat research and scholarly journals published in Canada with OA as a foundational principle. We need to consider the open dissemination of research outputs as public goods in a way that recognizes the importance of Canadian journals for our status as a research intensive country in a global context, and then ensure sustainability of that infrastructure. Small not-for-profit publishers in Canada have a challenging road ahead, especially with extreme pressures on library budgets. Essentially, our journals and the associated publishing enterprises are part of the invisible infrastructure research. Journals and related scholarly outputs play an irreplaceable role in advancing knowledge and should be treated as such. In the same way that our researchers rely on a robust broadband network of, for data exchange and communication as provided through Canary, open access to research outputs, uh, together with the associated tools of discovery, interconnectivity, and, and interoper interoperability uh, that reputable scholarly and scientific publishers provide is a foundational element of our national research infrastructure. Uh, for sustainability of this invisible but essential infrastructure, we need to incorporate increased support from the federal government in a pursuit of sustainable funding models for an, an enhanced OA research ecosystem. There is at present no, no federal support for the transformation and sustainability of our Canadian-based Canadian STEM publications to a full OA world, unlike the case in Europe, under Coalition S funders. So I just wanted to kind of share that as a comment. Um, it's a little bit self-serving in a sense because I, I am representing a not-for-profit publisher here in Canada, but um, I'm just not sure, it, you know, I don't know if, if Johan or, or Tim or anyone else that wanted to just kind of weigh in on, on that matter. Johan, we, we really touched on that, I guess, with your call for, for Canada uh, joining, uh, joining Plan S, um, but was, is there any, any other reflections from that comment? Yeah, I think the other reflection from that comment is, I mean, it goes a bit in this direction, I think. For research, we, 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 we support all kinds of infrastructures, right? Laboratories, uh, the 
the, the collider in uh, at CERN, you know, in Geneva, all sorts of big infrastructural pro projects. For some reason, publishing is never treated as an infrastructural project, which in fact it is. I mean, it should be treated as infrastructure, just like any other infrastructure. And I really don't understand why it isn't. It is probably because we have farmed it out for so long to the commercial publishers, but we should, we should really be treating it, at least part of it, as our own scientific infrastructure that is not just national, but that is an international infrastructure, glo global infrastructure. So I, I, I believe very strongly that that is the case. And that is also something that, in fact, we see as in terms of financing, right? That you could finance it globally and equitably in, in a way that everybody contributes. I mean, that's my hope. <laughs> well, well, that's great. Thank you very much. And I know, Tim, I'm not sure, were you going to add to that or? Yeah, I'll just add really quickly, Michael. I think I really like the comment. I'm not sure who, who provided, but I totally agree. Like, uh, I was quickly mentioning some uh, stats in terms of uh, the study of the Canadian journal landscape. So over 800 journals, only 5% attached to a commercial, big commercial publisher. So as, as the co uh, comment, uh, commentator was saying, you know, largely uh, small, largely not-for-profit, largely um, uh, annual annual expenditures, 40 to 80K, you know, if they're lucky, if they've got a grant from FRQSA or, or uh, SHRC, uh, they're, they're up at 80K. But basically a lot of volunteer work, right? They're supported by their library. They're without the volunteer labor and maybe, a, you know, a couple of students, they're not surviving. So definitely... Um, uh, definitely a point well taken. I think that's why I'm, I'm proud that SHRC provides the funding that we do. I think the, the, the larger point about um, about can we get more investment is key. And, you know, I, I can't lobby the government to give more money. I'd love to get more money to put into this program that I'm proud of. But I think as a community, when when there's lobbying to be done, I don't hear, as, as, as uh, Johan just mentioned, people lobbying for for this as much as the collider, right? They don't, they don't for this infrastructure, as much as the shiny infrastructure. So yeah, as, as the commentator the said- is that It's also fragmented, Tim. The, yeah. The problem is, I mean, these 800 journals are 800 islands. <laughs> and that's the trouble. I mean, you need to put that all together into one big alliance and make sure that this is a voice that is heard. And I mean, somebody has to do that. <laughs> Right. It's 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 just, and it's the same with diamond journals worldwide. I think. I mean, you know, you need some sort of an alliance showing what what an impact that has. Absolutely. Well, this this has been such a fascinating discussion, and I'm sorry that we are out of time now because there's a few questions we weren't able to get to that were also excellent questions uh, that would have been a great discussion topic. But what amazes me more than anything is just how far the the conversation on on open access and sustainable open access has really advanced, even in the past year. And it seems like it's something that's happening in real time, and uh, we're all we're all really uh, on this wave of m momentum, uh, which is very exciting. So I, I would like to wrap up the panel now, but I'd like to thank all the panelists for your excellent presentations, excellent Q&A session, uh, really appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank the RSC and the AB team that helped to support us here on the back end. And most importantly, for, for the brave folks that tuned in on a Sunday afternoon, thank you very much for joining us. It was great to have such a great audience and, and such a great uh, engaged uh, audience with great questions. So really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take care. And I will say also that uh, the video will actually be available in about a week. And actually, the link will remain live as well. So if there are additional questions that come in, including the ones that are already up there, we, we can address those actually even after the fact. So we can uh, follow up by email on, uh, on those questions as they come through. So we'll keep the dialogue moving. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much for inviting us, Michael.